information about another way that the public can engage in natural resource protection. So with that, turning it over to FWC, Andrew Woolley. Yes, thank you. I will be uh, presenting on how we use the Sawfish Encounter Hotline as a tool to promote small to sawfish recovery in the U.S. Next slide, please. So I'll essentially just be going over how the Sawfish Hotline works, what kind of information we get from the hotline, and how we use that information from both a management side of things and the stuff that we do, such as outreach and education, um, the tagging and sampling efforts that we put out and some of the research that's come out of our lab using this information. Also a little bit on some of the limitations of getting information this way. Next slide, please. So it all started back in the mid nineties when Adams and Wilson, uh, they started looking for landing records. So they reached out to state agencies, fishery surveys, museums, things like that, trying to get an idea of how many sawfish were being caught in the US. And unfortunately, they only came up with about 15 examples. And most of those were old historic reports like the photos you see here. Next slide, please. And their conclusions were essentially that the species could no longer be considered a functional member of the near shore coastal community. And they were basically on the verge of extinction. Next slide, please. Luckily, Greg and Jason at the Charlotte Harbor Field Lab thought that this sounded a little funny because Adams and Wilson hadn't used our FWC sampling data that showed sawfish catches in Charlotte Harbor. And they could go to local bait shops and see photos hanging on the wall of more recent captures of people just recreationally catching or seeing sawfish here in Charlotte Harbor. So they started putting out signs um, at local bait shops and boat ramps and fishing piers and such to reach out to anglers and try to have them report their encounters to us. Next slide, please. So eventually phones started ringing and emails started coming in and we started to get more pictures like this that are obviously more recent encounters, kind of more modern um, encounters of sawfish here in Florida and Charlotte Harbor. Next slide, please. So over the last 20 years, we've received about 4,000 individual reports. Most of those reports are just one single fish, but Sometimes people will see as many as 20 similarly sized individuals all in the same place at the same time. And while the majority of our reports come from Florida and the United States, we also receive some reports from the Bahamas, Australia, and even Fiji. Next slide, please. So when someone contacts us uh, to report their selfish encounter, we try to get their contact information and we ask them about 20 questions about each encounter. All this information is really important to us and we use all of it, but we try to focus on what we call the big three. And those big three are the estimated total length, including the rostrum. So from tip to tip, how big was the fish, um, the date of the encounter and the location. And we also ask people if they have photos or videos of the sawfish that they saw um, for a couple of reasons mainly because we want to verify that it wasn't back to sawfish. You'd be surprised some of the things that people report, whether that's needlefish, gar, even paddlefish in some areas, people report them thinking they're sawfish. Um, also, if we get a lot of very similar sounding reports from the same place in the same time, but from different people, we want to be able to see if we can compare photos and see if it's the same fish over and over or if they're different fish. Um, also, we want to ask people how they found out about reporting their encounters because we have a lot of resources out there with our information on them and we want to see what's actually working and getting the message out to the public. Next slide, please. For each report, we use a tool called the Geolocation Confidence Scale or GCS and that assigns every report a value from zero to six. A zero meaning they called us and said they caught a sawfish but that's it, we don't know where the sawfish was, we don't know anything about it. A six would be very, very accurate. They told us specifically where the sawfish was, or maybe they even provided GPS coordinates and we feel confident that we know where the sawfish was. Next slide, please. So in the last five years, we've received about 500 individual reports per year. And the vast majority of those come from Charlotte Harbor, 10,000 Islands and Western Everglades, and Florida Bay and the Florida Keys. Uh, but as you can see in the map to the right, um, 
there are some reports from outside of that range. This is just a handful of reports from the last few years. It's not all of them, um, but there are some reports from over on the East Coast and some points north like Tampa and off screen in Cedar Key and Cape Canaveral, places like that. Next slide, please. So we use this information for pretty much everything that we do, um, but obviously we don't have time to discuss all of these. So next slide, please. We just selected a couple short things that we're gonna talk about. Next slide, please. And those are the management implications of this information, how we use this info for outreach and education purposes, the tagging and sampling that we do and how this is beneficial to it. Uh, some of the research that's come out of our lab, and again, the limitations of collecting information this way. Next slide, please. So as Rachel mentioned earlier in her talk, uh, sawfish were protected in Florida in 1992, and then they were listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act in 2003. But in 2009, uh, small tooth sawfish juvenile critical habitat was established in two units, one in Charlotte Harbor and one in the 10,000 Islands and Everglades. And these are critical habitat for specifically small juveniles, where these are kind of nursery and foraging grounds for those animals. We're still working on getting uh, large juvenile and adult critical habitat established. Next slide, please. Also in 2009, the small tooth sawfish recovery plan was developed. And in the recovery plan, we established small tooth sawfish recovery regions, which breaks down the Gulf and Atlantic coast into different regions where we would expect recovery to take place as conservation efforts continue. So right now, mainly we get reports from G, H, and I, as you can see on the map there. Um, we consider that kind of their core range, but as time goes on and conservation continues, we like to see more and more reports from other recovery regions as well. Next slide, please. This information is also very valuable to um, federal permitting. It helps NOAA and the National Marine Fisheries Service use this information to make informed decisions uh, when it comes to development and different plans in certain areas. So for example, um, there's an area in the Peace River that we refer to as the Bayou. There were some development plans that were set out for there, but luckily different management agencies were able to make decisions based on some of this information as well. Next slide, please. We also use a lot of the uh, media that comes from these reports, the photos and videos for presentations that we do at local schools and colleges and local events like um, boat shows and fishing clubs, scientific meetings like this. For example, in the photo there, you can see Adam Brame. He's the NOAA Sawfish Recovery Coordinator. And he was giving a presentation last year at uh, SeaWorld for International Sawfish Day. And in his presentation there is actually a photo that was taken from the encounter, uh, the encounter reporting hotline and used in his presentation there. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of resources out there with our information on it to kind of promote the hotline. Um, so you might have seen these signs here on the left at boat ramps and fishing piers and such around the state. We also had a large billboard on the side of US-1 headed down to the Keys, just trying to get the word out that we would like to remind anglers and boaters and anybody who could possibly see a sawfish to please report their encounters to us. And on all those signs, they were actually using photos from the encounter hotline. Next slide, please. The hotline also allows us to build and maintain relationships with the public, especially charter captains and anglers who can be out on the water more often than we can. Uh, we're not out there all the time, so sometimes people that are out there more can see things that we wouldn't otherwise see. For example, a local charter captain a couple of years ago um, caught a large female sawfish out in the middle of Charlotte Harbor and was able to document some photos of fresh mating wounds all over their or her dorsal and caudal fin, which is something that we had never seen in Charlotte Harbor before. So it's just interesting that we can, we can learn things from the public and the public can teach us things and we can also teach them things as well. Next slide, please. One of the really important things that we use this information for is it helps us to direct our sampling efforts when we go out and try to tag small tooth sawfish. And 
for example, if we catch or if we have a bunch of reports of small juveniles, those are fish under six, under about six feet, then we can target our sampling to go after those specifically using gill nets and um, heading out towards shallow water where people have reported seeing sawfish. Next slide, please. Um, on the other hand, if we get a bunch of reports of large juvenile or adult sawfish, the size class that Rachel was talking about earlier, then we can target those deep holes that she mentioned and we can go to different areas where people have reported these fish and change up our, our gear type to target that size class. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Another really important part of this is we rely on the hotline not only for reports of live sawfish, but also unfortunately deceased sawfish. So if someone sees a carcass out there and they can let us know where it is, we might be able to go and salvage that carcass and perform either a field necropsy or bring it back to the lab. Um, and learn more about these animals because they're critically endangered so we can't sacrifice an animal to learn more about them. But even if a fish is really um, decomposed like the one on the left, we can still go out and get vertebrae from it and learn more about them. Next slide, please. As Aliyah's talk mentioned earlier, we also had an eDNA sampling project going on which targeted what we refer to as the non-core range. So like I mentioned earlier, that area of Southwest Florida where on the map here, there's a bunch of little dots, that's kind of their core range and that's where we do most of our sampling. But we wanted to target areas outside of that core range, which is highlighted by these yellow boxes. And we used the encounter hotline to point us in the right direction as to where people were actually seeing and catching sawfish in areas like Tampa Bay and the Indian River Lagoon. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned before, the hotline enables us to come in contact with people from all different walks of life, and we can learn more from them, especially as far as technology is concerned. Some people can expose us to technologies that would be really helpful to our sampling efforts, like side, scans, side scan imaging, drone photography, aerial photography, and beta remote underwater video, which all these things are, are technologies that we don't currently use, um, but they obviously capture photos and videos of sawfish that we wouldn't have otherwise seen. Next slide, please. In 2006, Greg came out with a paper on the anthropogenic effects of marine debris on small tooth sawfish. And in the years since then, we've received uh, a multitude of additional documentation, whether that's the bungee cores that Rachel mentioned earlier is kind of the hot topic right now, or crab trap ropes, ropes nets, dog toys, onion bags, all sorts of things these fish get entangled in. Next slide, please. And with any tagging and sampling, or any tagging program, recapture information is really valuable to us. So when anglers recapture a tagged sawfish, it's great that we can receive photos and information about those fish again, and we know that they're out there alive and well. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, most people send us pictures that look like this. Uh, rarely do we ever get a tag that has one of the actual tag identification numbers on it. It's just our phone number. Still very helpful. We appreciate people letting us know that they caught a tag sawfish, but we're working on figuring that out. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned, there are a lot of limitations to this type of information gathering. Um, unfortunately, we can't make assumptions on abundance based off of reporting because there's a lot of factors at play there that affect how many sawfish are getting reported, whether that's weather or uh, just more heavier fishing pressure or just people becoming more aware about reporting. Just because we get more reports doesn't necessarily mean that there are more or less sawfish out there. Also gear selectivity is a big thing. Most of these fish that we get reports from are small juveniles, those under six foot fish, but that doesn't mean that there aren't large juveniles and adults out there. It might just be that a lot of these fish are encountered in inshore shallow water where people are using light tackle, generally speaking. And if you hook into a 600 pound fish on 10 pound test, then you probably won't ever figure out what took your bait. And we're also missing information from commercial fishermen. We get a lot of pictures like this on the right hand side that are kind of second hand sent to us saying, hey, did you see this? But we don't ever get the actual reports and hear from those people. Next slide, please. 
so in conclusion, the hotline is just one of multiple lines of evidence to support recovery, along with some of the other things that Rachel and Aaliyah talked about before. And the hotline is an important tool for outreach and education, helps us to both teach the public and learn from the public, and then we can take that information and pass that along to managers. And the encounter reports directly improve our sampling because it's a lot easier to catch a sawfish when you know where they are. And although it's not perfect, we find it still really helpful. Next slide. Thank you to everybody who keeps the phones ringing and the people at the Charlotte Harbor Field Lab who answer the phones and help us out getting this information. That's it. Great, thank you, Andrew. Uh, that was very interesting. I think that sawfish must be one of the most interesting species we have. I mean, I, I know they're all beautiful and important, but they have a special place in my heart, I know for sure. Um, okay, so those of you online, if you go into minty.com, you'll see the code at the top of the screen. We have a bunch of questions here, Andrew, so feel free to answer as many as you can in, in four or so minutes. All right. Um, I, see I see the, the first, first question, question is, is, do you continue to engage with local anglers who use the hotline to link other anglers or hotspots? Um, kind of. We do have kind of a system of people who contact us very regularly. So we can build relationships with certain people and it definitely does help us to kind of zoom in on specific hotspots. Um, what was the most unexpected location? Definitely Fiji. Um, it wasn't a small tooth sawfish, but that was pretty cool. Are signage and educational materials available to local land conservation groups for outreach? Um, as far as signage is concerned, I think there is a way that um, if you reach out, we, we can probably help with that. I'm not exactly sure about other educational materials, but feel free to reach out. We can talk about that. Are there any adult sightings or catch data in the harbor or passes? Um, a lot of our data, I'm not sure if it's necessarily public facing, but yes, there are adult sightings in, within Charlotte Harbor and around the passes from time to time. Is this data public given the status of sawfish under, so I guess I just kind of answered that question. Um, it's not exactly public facing right now, no. And I can't read that one, sorry. Do you know how did sawfish habitat being present impact permitting or mitigation for a sun seeker? Um, not exactly sure about that. That gets passed on to management agencies like uh, National Marine Fisheries and Army Corps of Engineers and stuff like that. And then the last question I see is, is it difficult to gain trust of anglers who are worried when they accidentally catch a sawfish? Generally speaking, not too much. Um, some people are harder to crack than others. Like I mentioned with the commercial fishermen, we don't get a lot of information from them. And I think that is partially a, a trust thing that we need to build on. Um, but a lot of anglers are pretty forthcoming and we definitely appreciate the information. Um, we're not trying to get anybody in trouble for accidentally catching a sawfish. It happens, so we understand that. I think that's it. All right, since we just have a minute. Oh, there's a new one that just came in. Our most reports is five a fish. Yes, yes so, so we, we receive, receive about 500 reports a year, approximately. And of those, I would guess that less than 10 are dead. So the vast majority are live fish, which is great. All right, um, we'll see, we'll give it just 30 more seconds here in case a question comes in. All right, seeing none. Uh, thank you so much, Andrew. And